are these people? We've got Indy Media Award honorees in the house again. Let's switch to this view. I like this view. Better. The dissenter, Kevin Gastola and Mohamed Omazi, the two of them together were a tag team, especially in 2024. Um, Mohammed being on site at the Royal Courts of, of Justice in London. Justice. Hilarious. Um, <laughs> the Halls of Injustice. Right. Later at the Halls of Injustice. Uh, meanwhile. <laughs> meanwhile. So, so they have been on the inside and speaking with the family and reporting from inside the courthouse. And they've done an amazing job when it comes to the center. And Kevin's been all over the place this week being interviewed. Yeah. Um, and want to thank you. you know, we covered, we have been covering basically since episode one. I was putting in that in that ticker, free Julian Assange. We've been saying free Julian Assange, and we've been fighting to to see Julian freed, and we got to see that this week. And yep. it was it was an amazing sight. Um, I put together a Substack article this week. We talked about it on INN News, and for those who and I think everyone has, but for fifteen seconds, it's worth it. To see him sign the paperwork oh, we'll have a we don't have a and watch him get June. on the plane. June. Was something to see. And uh, I don't think any of us were. Well, I, I know none of us were expecting it. And it kind of broke Saturday, you know, on Monday night at seven o'clock. And like everything kind of stopped. And then we were just following, we were following a plane track being tracked around the globe <clears throat> and watching him get in and out of a car and stand in front of a judge. Well, we heard he stood in front of a judge and we heard him say a couple of lines and they said, you can go free. And, uh, we go party. how the hell did that happen when everybody's been fighting and screaming and everything else? Well, they they decided to publish what they at least have learned from all that they have experienced and gathered as their version of the story. And yes, big cook bad cookies, I am so glad Assange is free. This is what we fought for. And shout out to Misty Woo! and shout out to all of the activists and the people who Stood out there with banners in the rain and umbrellas and and who who protested and with megaphones outside Merrick Garland's house, um, who who gave speeches outside the Justice Department and all over the country. So many people to thank, but what we want to what we want to do, and we we've done that a lot already but what what we want to do tonight is talk about I the inside thank you very much the inside the plea deal and find out why the government abruptly ended the case and that's what we couldn't all figure out what's the why why the motivation mm. for the US government now now i think that part of it had to do why 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 before we why? start this i think the part of it had to do with the fact that they had lost the appeal, the you know, that Julian had won the right to appeal and that they did not want yeah. a lot of the stuff coming out during an appeal hearing that <clears> would <throat> potentially come out. Especially when it involves people not getting the First Amendment. Like, I think that was a big part of that. That, that whole appeal hearing. Oh, no. And, and it puts British extradition in in place so but weird restream lost connection yeah. to for a second okay it's back all right so inside the assange plea deal why the u.s abruptly uh, why the u.s government abruptly ended the case 
according to these guys and what they had heard. U.S. prosecutors brushed aside calls to end the case against the WikiLeaks founder until a British appeals court granted a hearing on the First Amendment. And that's basically what they're trying to say. And this was made possible by paid subscribers of the dissenter become a paid sub with this special offer and support independent journalism on press freedom. I am a paid annual subscriber to the dissenter. I have been for three years. Well, first it was shadow proof, but I've since uh, Kevin broke off of shadow proof and started the dissenter. I have been an annual for 50 bucks a year paid subscriber. Big fan. He's one of the best. He's one of the best writers there is when it comes to the journal to the song story. So, but this is him and Mohammed. Mostly, this is Mohammed writing, and I, and Mohammed's been on with with Torah, and you can look up that interview on the politics of survival. But for five years, the U.S. Justice Department defied calls from around the world to drop Espionage Act charges against WikiLeaks founder Julian Assange. Prosecutors even faced pressure from the Australian government, which demanded that a close ally end the case and return one of their citizens to his home country. Yet. Prosecutors remain committed to putting him on trial. That all changed in May after the British High Court of Justice granted Assange an extradition appeal hearing on the question of the First Amendment of the U.S. Constitution. The Justice Department re-engaged, quote-unquote, Assange's legal team and participated in very intense negotiations for a plea deal. U.S. prosecutors accepted a guilty plea to one conspiracy charge under the Espionage Act with no additional prison sentence. The plea deal did not contain a gag order, which is also very important, and officials agreed yep. to Assange's request to avoid travel to the continental U.S. He was released on bail from Belmarsh Prison and flew on a charter flight to a courthouse in a U.S. territory in the Pacific Ocean known as the Northern Mariana Islands. Where? There, I Y'all believe, don't know where that shit's at. Well, Saipan, I believe it's, it's That's actually made up like place. an offshoot, of, like an island off, the, off of Japan, that another imperialist island that we just decided to annex, I guess. Yeah. How the hell does that happen? Yeah, it's part of that Pacific theater. Um... More importantly, the Justice Department took it and kept it. Right, during World War II, I would guess. But more importantly, mm -hmm. the Justice Department imagine. pledged not to pursue any future charges for any uncharged conduct that Assange allegedly committed prior to his guilty plea. That also is important. It wipes his slate clean. This, abru this abrupt shift brought a conclusion to a 14-year-long legal saga on June 26th. The award-winning journalist had spent a little more than five years detained at Belmarsh Prison, which is often referred to as Britain's Guantanamo. Judge, yep. Judge Ramona Manglonia accepted the plea deal and sentenced Assange to time served. Quote, I do hope that there will be, in fact, some peace restored, Manglonia remarked. Quote, I'll just note, too, that this past week, the island has been celebrating 80 years of peace since the Battle of Saipan. This was a very bloody place between the Japanese and the Americans. The people have been celebrating the fact that we've been celebrating peace here with the former enemy. And now there is some peace that you need to restore to yourself when you walk out and you pursue your life as a free man. Before ending the proceeding, Manglonia added, Mr. Assange, apparently it's an early happy birthday to you. That's his birthday we know is July 3rd, so happy birthday, Julian. And it's probably the first one that you'll have outside of a prison or any type of limitation. A press conference was held by Stella and Assange's legal team in Canberra after Assange landed in Australia. Let's watch... The video of that here. Stella! Somewhere here. Sorry, Jeremy, I, I, I need to interrupt you. We, have, we now have Welcome live feeds uh, basically of Julian stepping out of the plane and come back. Oh, please, let's see it. Oh, it's, it's such a. Well done, he's walking Dad! on the tarmac. Uh, uh, I, I don't know if he's. I, 
he's waving to the crowd. It's it's such a joyous moment. I'm I'm not sure you can see well it, but uh, you know, believe me, this is it. such an emotional emotional moment. Uh, he is looking so great. Uh, it's uh, uh, just. Uh, I saw pictures of me. It looked a lot better than last time I saw him. Well, if 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 you think that I have uh, uh, maybe uh, uh, backtracked Jim a few years, I can tell you that, that he is. Mm -hmm. He's looking a lot better than inside yeah, Belmont's prison. It's such a great moment. He is uh, he's well clenching done, his mate. fists and waving to the crowd. What a great moment in history to uh, witness and uh, and be a part of it, Jeremy. And uh, thank yeah. you. I mean, we are we are we should all be. Uh, I'm just getting it on my phone now. Wow. He is meeting wow. Sarah now. Oh my God. Um, yeah. Kissing Stella, you know, this is my God. And uh, John Shipton is there, his father, you know, reuniting with the family. What a great moment, Jeremy, to be watching this. Julie, this is, uh, come here! Something we've been oh, fighting fantastic. for, waiting for. Absolutely fantastic. It is. Uh, <laughs> it's, oh my God, it's, it's hard not to be emotional under these circumstances. Jeremy, I hope you. Appreciate that. Absolutely, it's, it's been something we've been waiting for for a, a very long time. Oh, that's uh, amazing, isn't it? My God, can't wait to hear his voice. So great to see his face. There's Stella's post, but well, getting. <clears throat> go ahead. I we did get to hear from in the courtroom. I don't know if you brought that too, but I, I didn't. But we have heard heard that. Um, the U.S. came back to the table after the appeal hearing was granted. We found this out. Justice Department prosecutors were not truly motivated to come to a plea agreement with Assange until weeks ago, like we said, after the high court granted him the right to appeal. Quote, the negotiations were a protracted process that went on for several months, sort of in fits and starts, says Barry Pollack, and that's his Australian lawyer. We were not close to any sort of resolution until a few weeks ago when the Department of Justice re-engaged and there have been very intense negotiations over the past few weeks. This point was also emphasized by Stella, who said it was important to recognize that Julian's release and the breakthrough in negotiations came at a time where there had been a breakthrough in the legal case in the UK. The High Court had allowed permission to appeal like we said, there was a court date set for the 9th and 10th of July in which Julian would be able to raise the First Amendment argument at the high court. Well, wait a minute. At least his legal team would. He probably would not because he has not been able to attend a hearing of his since October of 2021. Even remotely. It's still fucking weird. How, how is it that he was unable, too unwell to attend even remotely the appeal hearing in May, on May 20th, the decision, yet that guy didn't seem unwell whatsoever. That's all I'm saying. But anyway, Assange was granted the right to appeal in his extradition on the basis that it was at least arguable that he would be prejudiced at trial by reason of his nationality and citizenship. The UK Extradition yeah. Act of 2003 prohibits extradition to a country where a person may be prejudiced at trial by reason of their nationality. Well, the clown show of the year, Assistant U.S. Attorney Gordon Cromberg, a lead prosecutor on the case, told the courts that the U.S. government might argue during trial proceedings that Assange was not protected by the First Amendment. I didn't even know that that was possible, but guess what? <laughs> Foreigners don't get First Amendment protection automatically. They have to petition and be granted permission. Insane. Kromberg made a formal sworn declaration on behalf of the respondent and in support of the extradition request. He put himself forward as able to provide authoritative assistance as to the application of the First Amendment. It can be fairly assumed that he would not have said that the prosecution could argue that foreign nationals are not entitled to the protections under the First Amendment unless that was a tenable argument that the prosecution was entitled to deploy with a real prospect of success, unquote. All right, so that is also important because, yeah, he was going to, all right, he made a sworn declaration that they were not going to automatically grant him First Amendment protections. 
And that's a problem. He didn't get the ability to have free speech. Yeah. If such an argument... He said he succeeded. can bring it up. Right. To petition for it, but, but they, that's all they it said. wasn't guaranteed. Yeah. But if such an argument were to succeed, it would at least arguably cause the applicant prejudice on the grounds of his non-U.S. citizenship and hence on the grounds of his nationality, the court added. The U.S. government deployed their hubristic argument about Assange and the First Amendment as part of their defense of the extradition request, and it backfired. Now, also, and they don't even mention any of this, to me it was the death penalty thing that was just as big a deal as the whole First Amendment question. British law says that if there is the possibility that he could potentially even be charged in the future with a death penalty charge, they cannot send him. And that was also part of the appeal. Marjorie Cohn, who's the, de the dean of the People's Academy of International Law and former president of the National Lawyers Guild, asserted, it is no coincidence the plea came a little more than a month after the High Court of England and Wales ruled that Assange could appeal the extradition order against him. Uh, the Justice Department apparently feared it would lose the appeal. Now, somebody else would say that it is the Royal Courts of London and that this is not England or Wales or Great Britain, but London is a separate yeah. entity in itself that has its city own of set London. of laws. The city of London is where he was imprisoned. Yeah. That is who has the rights to HMP Belmarsh, apparently. It's very weird legal shit. Stella said she believed the negotiations revealed how uncomfortable the U.S. government is, in fact, with having these arguments aired, which of course they are, because they don't want to have them clarified in court. They'd rather have it be vague and open to their interpretation as often as they'd like. The fact that this case is an attack on journalism, it's an attack on the public's right to know, and it should never have been brought, she concluded. Julian should never have spent a single day in prison, but today we celebrate because today Julian is free. It almost sounds like Passover. We're, once we were slaves in Egypt and now we are free. Because that's what we used to do every, every year. Anyway. Um, the U.S. agreeing not to pursue further charges, of course. One of the most incredible revelations regarding Assange's plea deal is that the U.S. government agreed that they would not bring any other charges against Julian for any conduct, any publications, any news gathering, anything at all that occurred prior to the time of the plea. This is of particular note because, as Pollock explained, even if Assange succeeded in his appeal against extradition, that success would have just resolved this case. Yeah. The 18-count indictment against Assange focused almost exclusively on the WikiLeaks publisher's role in obtaining, possessing, and, uh, and publishing documents between 2009 and 2011, known as the Iraq War Logs, Afghanistan War Diaries, Guantanamo Bay detainee files, and diplomatic cable, or cable gate. One yeah. diplomatic charge under the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act was disturbingly expanded by prosecutors to include a speech that Assange gave to a room of computer specialists during which he encouraged people to provide WikiLeaks with information which was in the public interest. On top of the fact that their whistleblower star witness was a convicted pedophile and admitted that he lied. Oh yeah, there's that too. However, Assange was never charged for WikiLeaks' role in publishing emails belonging to the DNC. Acts which, for, which even former FBI Director Robert Mueller concluded were likely protected by the First Amendment. However, yeah. if he didn't have any First Amendment protections, hmm, nor was Assange most importantly ever charged for WikiLeaks' 2017 expose detailing the CIA's expansive cyber warfare arsenal known as the Vault 7 materials. This, to me, is the crux the leak and the publication of the files led Mike Pompeo, when he was CIA director, to reportedly obsess over targeting, kidnapping, or killing Assange in revenge. He had him deemed a terrorist. He had WikiLeaks deemed a non-hostile state actor, which allowed them to break every U.S. law to pursue him and align with Mossad, allegedly the Adelson family, 
allegedly to spy on Assange in the Ecuadorian embassy using UC Global, the security company that the Ecuadorian embassy had hired to oversee security at the building. We know that from the David Morales trial that's happening and happened in Spain. When the, with the plea agreement, which is there in PDF form, which the dissenter reviewed, the U.S. government cannot ever bring a case against Assange for other Who acts of journalism. Hey, look at that. Tony Bostono from the Accord Lord. Woo! They never stop being you. Isn't that nice? Thank you, Sean. Much, much appreciated. Love you all. Well, you, the United States agrees not to bring any additional charges against the defendant based on the conduct that occurred prior to the time of this plea agreement. The plea agreement states, unless defendant breaches this plea agreement. Judge Manglonia said, I was quite surprised, but I think it was quite a very, I think it's a very generous statement. She noted that it applied to everything for the past 14 years, and that's very broad. Another key position that Assange's legal team took during the negotiations was that any resolution would have to end this matter, according to Pollitt, meaning that Julian would be free and that he was not going to do any additional time in prison. He wasn't going to do any time under supervision, and he wasn't going to do any time under a gag order. And if that's the case... We'd love to hear him speak. So, of course, here's the political lobbying behind the scenes. Jennifer Robinson, who is... Her law firm, by the way, is also part of the George Clooney White Helmets, uh, one of the Clooney Foundation of Justice, which supports the White Helmets and regime change, and is highly problematic. I got big issues with her and her firm. But Australian human rights attorney Jennifer Robinson, who represented Assange in the UK, further described the strong political dimension to the case. Extensive lobbying efforts by members of the Australian government proved crucial to the overall result. The way I know this is bullshit is Robinson thanked her personal friend, her close, close personal friend, her her close personal friend and Australian Prime Minister Anthony Albanese. For doing fucking nothing but his principal oh. leadership, statesmanship, and diplomacy for tepidly garbage. for tepidly once in a meeting with Joe Biden, maybe could you ask, could you maybe think about possibly helpfully fitted? She explained that raising opposition nope. to Assange's extradition at the highest levels of the US government completely changed the situation for Julian and enabled our negotiations with the U.S. government that allowed us to reach this outcome. It also shows that Scott Morrison was a complete fucking piece of shit and every other prime minister prior to Albo was also a complete fucking piece of shit. Yep. There were about three decent members of parliament in Australia. Andrew Wilkie is the one that I remember the most. Uh, there were a couple others that were mentioned today on Slow News Day, but not very many stood up for, for Julian, their own citizen. How dare you! The Prime Minister was under intense and growing pressure from the wider public, parts of the press, and an increasing number of Australian members of Parliament. Also because he promised that he would fight for Assange before he became Prime Minister when he was also a member of Parliament. Oh yeah, there's that too. Robinson credited Kevin Rudd, who was Australia's ambassador to the U.S. and a former Australian prime minister himself, as well as Stephen Smith, who was Australia's high commissioner to the U.K. and the consular staff in London. Smith accompanied Assange on his flight from London to Saipan. Because somebody from the Five Eyes was not going to let their eyes off of him, of course. Until he actually went through his plea. He explained that Rudd's yeah. relentless efforts in Washington, working together closely with us, with myself and my co-counsel, Barry Pollack, completely changed our relationship with the U.S. and completely changed the negotiations. Bullshit. Without his efforts and his adept diplomacy, we would not be in this position we are today, and Julian would not be home. Yeah, also, journalism okay? would still not be a crime officially, but that's another story. I'm like, 
Sounded like you had like a like a throat thing happen. I, oh shit! What? You're all right. Uh, mm, mm. <laughs> Speaking to the Australian Broadcasting yeah, look Corp- Corporation on June 27th, of course, they get the exclusive first interview. Robinson explained that once Ambassador Rudd was sent to Washington, D.C., the U.S. Department of Justice finally started to deal with the defense team in a meaningful way. That opened up conversations for us with the Department of Justice that we were trying to have and were not getting responses, and so things moved. What the fuck took you so long, assholes, is all I got to say. Mm-hmm. And that is counter to what Kevin is reporting. If Jen is saying that it was the ambassador coming over and talking to the Justice Department, but Kevin's saying that it was because of what the high court ruling says, which is it? As many people, yeah. including including Stella, argued over the past few years, this was a politically motivated prosecution. No, it was a persecution. And therefore, it stood to reason that this would that that it would be political pressure, which would ultimately resolve the case. The lobbying efforts of high-ranking Australian politicians and government officials would not have occurred without the intense lobbying of everyday members of the public, activists, and press freedom and human rights organizations, the latter of which were brought on board as a result of intensive upward pressure. Again, I'm going to stop there and repeat that sentence because that also is more than vaguely important. The lobbying efforts of high-ranking Australian politicians and government officials, fuck them, would not have occurred without the intense lobbying of everyday members of the public, that's you guys, activists, that's also you guys, and press freedom and human rights organizations. Sometimes they already, they fell on their faces too, like the CPJ and Reporters Without Borders and the Freedom of the Press Foundation that all acted like they were in Julian's quarter, but certainly fell on their faces more often than not. Yeah, plenty of those can fuck right off. A number of years ago, there were only a few political figures in the UK and Australia who were willing to to be open and clear in their opposition to Assange's extradition. For example, people such as then Labour MP for Derby North, Chris Williamson, and George Galloway, who was recently re-elected to Parliament, as well as Australia's independent MP for Clark, Tasmania, uh, Andrew Wilkie, and the Conservative politician George Christensen, at the time a member of the House of Representatives with the National Liberal Party for Dawson, Queensland. It took millions of people, Stella In says. Queensland working behind the scenes, people protesting on the streets for days and weeks and months and years. Very cliche. But here's the part, one of the parts that hurt. Assange was required to instruct WikiLeaks to destroy all unpublished files. And this is one of the things that we had to sacrifice and had to give up. This was not a total 100% spike the football win with no consequences. Before Assange's guilty plea was entered in court, the agreement with the U.S. government required him to take all action within his control to cause the return of the US, to the U.S. or the destruction of any such unpublished information in his possession, custody, or control, or that of WikiLeaks or any affiliate of WikiLeaks, unquote. Now, my guess is that he doesn't have anything he didn't publish. But if he did, he'd have to destroy it. Yeah. Barry Pollack confirmed that Assange has instructed Kristen Hernassen to destroy any materials they might have had that were not published. WikiLeaks editor-in-chief Kristen Hernassen confirmed to the dissenter that Assange had requested that he destroy all published U.S. secret documents, all unpublished U.S. secret documents. We just got crashed. This provision in the plea agreement echoed the infamous decision by 2013 editors at the Guardian newspaper to take a power drill and an angle grinder to a hard drive, which contained copies of vast troves of information leaked by National Security Agency whistleblower Edward Snowden and to then Guardian columnist Glenn Greenwald. Okay. Editors were then threatened with legal action if they did not enter, if they did not either 
hand over the hard drives. Um, they agreed to destroy them in the basement of their headquarters in London, even though it was understood that copies existed elsewhere outside of the UK. <clears throat> Technicians from government communications headquarters, the UK equivalent of the NSA, filmed the destruction of the computer hard drive while taking notes and providing instructions to the editors. Guardian editor Paul Johnson was among those who described the destruction as purely symbolic act since everyone involved knew that there were copies of the materials which revealed the details of Anglo-American mass warrantless spying and surveillance of hundreds of million, millions of people in the U.S. and around the world. Yet the act was more than symbolic. It was a potent reminder of the power of the U.K. government acting with the encouragement of the U.S. national security state and its ability to threaten and bend even well-known and even well-resourced establishment news media to its will. As investigative journalist Kit Clarenberg recounted, another Indie Media Award honoree, recounted for the dissenter, three years after the destruction of the hard drive, the Guardian's investigative team was dissolved and Guardian coverage of military, security, and intelligence issues declined precipitously. That's to say the least. In fact, presently, many key national security correspondents at The Guardian have little background in the field. Not a surprise. The U.S. did not or could not identify any victims. And we knew this always was the case. But it's nice to have it officially in writing. The U.S. government was unwilling or unable to identify any victim of the published leaks. And prosecutors mm -hmm. did not request that Assange pay restitution for any alleged harm. However, during a press briefing on June 26, State Department spokesperson Matthew Miller, Smug Count Smugula, maintained that there were victims. If you recall, when WikiLeaks first disseminated and published State Department information cables, they did so without redacting names. Except that wasn't them, asshole. That was Cryptome. Yep. Yeah. He says they just threw them out there for all the world to see. And so the documents they published gave identifying information of individuals who were in contact with the State Department. That included opposition leaders, human rights activists around the world whose positions were put in some danger because of their public disclosure. Well, those of you who covered the State Department at the time will probably remember that in the days leading up to the release, to that release, the State Department really had to scramble to get people out of danger to move them out of harm's way. Bullshit! He offered to sit down and have a conversation with Hillary Clinton about it, and she stonewalled him. That's nonsense. He even offered to delay the release if that's what they needed. They never responded. This is all fucking fiction. Miller was not at the State Department. He was working at the time as a Justice Department spokesman in President Barack Obama's administration. And in fact, Miller opposed the Assange prosecution before he was an, an official in President Joe Biden's administration. You fucking hypocrite. Count Smugula. The entire cache of 250,000 plus diplomatic cables became available on the internet because Guardian editor David Lee included the passphrase for an encrypted file containing the cables in a book he co-authored about working with WikiLeaks. Assange called the State Department to warn them of the risks posed by the publication of unredacted cables. This is what I'm saying. Julian tried to work with them. I appreciate that you've recognized that these kinds of releases absolutely can pose a threat to the very sources reflected in the material, said Cliff Johnson. Miller complained about the supposed negative impact that the <laughs> release of the cables had on U.S. diplomacy, but Secretary of Defense Robert Gates said when the cables were first published, quote, I've heard the impact of these releases on our foreign policy described as a meltdown, as a game changer, and so on, and I think those descriptions are fairly significantly overwrought. Uh-huh. Yes, Kit Clarenberg is back on Twitter, by the way. And we covered that. Yeah. The fact is, governments deal yeah. with the United States because it's in their interest. Not because they like us, not because they trust us, and not because they believe we can keep secrets. 
He also said every other government in the world knows the United States government leaks like a sieve, and it has for a long time. Associated re Press reporter Matthew Lee, who was one of the only decent reporters in the White House press room, along with Simon Atiba, was covering the State Department when, when WikiLeaks first published the cables. As he recalled, quote, there was no public concern that was raised about the potential security risks posed to sources who might have been quoted. Aside from the cables, the U.S. military was never able to find any evidence that the publications of military war logs from Iraq and Afghanistan resulted in any person's death. Again, that's an important phrase. The U.S. military was never able to find any evidence that the publications of military war logs from Iraq and Afghanistan resulted in any person's death. Pentagon Papers whistleblower uh -huh. Daniel Ellsberg testified at Assange's hearing in September 2020. He noted that Assange withheld 15,000 files from the, with, from the release of the Afghanistan war logs. He also requested assistance from the State Department and Defense Department on redacting names but they refuse to help WikiLeaks redact a single document, even though it's a standard journalistic practice to consult officials to minimize harm. Which he did. He says, oh. I have, Ellsberg says, I have no, no doubt that Julian would have removed those names. Both the Pentagon and State Department could have helped WikiLeaks remove the names of individuals. Rather than take steps to protect individuals, Ellsberg suggested U.S. officials chose to preserve the possibility of charging Mr. Assange with precisely the charges that he faced. And of course, we know that Julian stated in court that he committed journalism. The U.S. Yep. government may have, have accepted a plea deal that showed Assange some mercy, but they still coerced or forced the WikiLeaks founder to plead guilty to journalism if he wanted to obtain his freedom. At the court hearing in Saipan, Judge Manglonia asked Assange to describe what he did that constituted the crime charged. I was work working as a journalist, he says, and I don't know if you have this audio, I did not bring it up, but he says, working as a journalist, I encouraged my source it's to right, provide it's information. It's right there, I think. Is it? The video. Oh. You click that. At this time, I'm asking you um, to explain yes, to me what is it that you did That's that the judge. constitute the crime charged. Working as a journalist, I encouraged my source to provide uh, information that was said to be classified uh, in order to publish that information. I believe that the First Amendment uh, protected that activity, but I accept that, as written, it's a violation of the Espionage Act statute. So you had certain belief, but you understand what the law actually says as well. I believe the First Amendment and the Espionage Act are in contradiction uh, with each other, uh, but I accept that. Uh, that it would be difficult to win such a case in given all the circumstances. Yeah. So. Why am I hearing Miss Peggy? <laughs> Because he did it for us. Oh. What? No. Um, Essentially, Assange recalled an, act, recalled an act that reporters at numerous media outlets commit r routinely, and the judge accepted that as a crime. Matthew McKenzie, deputy chief for, counter, for the counterintelligence and export control section of the US, in the U.S. Justice, Department, Justice Department's National Security Division, emphasize that the U.S. government rejects Assange's contention that his conduct should be protected by the First Amendment. The U.S. Justice Department could have celebrated the end of this legal saga and spun it as a victory, but prosecutors put out an announcement that contained no statements from Attorney General Merrick Garland, 
the U.S. Attorney for the Eastern District of Virginia, or any prosecutors who were involved in the case. It contained a closing argument that one might hear before the jury deliberated over a verdict, but no proclamations of victory. Now you have Stephen Rohde, who is a constitutional scholar and former chair of the ACLU Foundation of Southern California, said, quote, when U.S. prosecutors had to put up or shut up to satisfy the high, the high court that Assange's right to freedom of expression would be protected if he was extradited, they blinked. And Assange's trial posed grave risks that the U.S. would be embarrassed by revelations that the CIA had plotted to kidnap or assassinate him. Not really, because we've known about that for three fucking years. Plus, the case ended in a whimper for the U.S. government. Not for activists, but for the U.S. government. In contrast, Assange and his legal team were mindful of the damage to press freedom, but jubilant that one of the most well-known political prisoners in the world was free. For journalists and media organizations around the world, it was a bittersweet outcome. I think that was fair. David, I agree that was an ingenious answer, which I would expect no less from Julian. But after five years of being abused and tortured, it was shocking to hear him with such clarity and amazing. But Kevin says, like Jennifer explained at the press conference, the plea agreement has no impact on legal precedent. It is the prosecution itself which set the precedent that media professionals anywhere in the world can face prosecution by the U.S. under a law with no public interest defense for the crime of journalism. Journalism is not a crime, fam. How many times we got to tell you? Journalism is not a crime, as it says down there in the scrolling ticker. And that is what I continue to carry the fight on, is that journalism is not a crime. Man.